name is uh, by the staff data scientist at Menu. Okay, so a little bit about this project. So this is a collaboration actually between Menu and the GMD Laboratory for Physical Sciences, uh, or LPS for short. This began during a Mandia internship in 2020 and later became sponsored by LPS. Our current affiliations are uh, up there. Uh, David and I with Lincoln, Ed is with Blue Allen, Jim is with LPS, and Daniel is with the University of Florida. So before diving in, I'll first go into a little bit of the motivation in terms of commercial ML and malware analysis solutions. Um, and existing and sort of idealized approaches to malware analysis. So there's been a lot of industry focus on detection and detection is great, but there are a lot of other use cases for ML. Um, some of these might include classification, information retrieval, analysis, contextualization, et cetera. Uh, on the right hand side here, I'm just showing a few different um, tasks that we can use ML to do on the malware analysis front. We have, say, family uh, classification, attribute tagging, uh, TTP summarization, exploit vulnerability analysis, and authorship attribution. Um, ideally, we have some sort of a representation that's able to do all of this. Uh, oftentimes, in reality, though, we have issues with various factors, including the time and resource intensiveness of, of training these classifiers. Uh, we also have a limited number of labeled samples for some of these. Um, there's model updating and storage complexity. And then of course, there's also the time and resources involved for the labeling. So wouldn't it be great if we had just one shared representation that we could incorporate a bunch of contextual and semantic data for, and then use this for multiple problem scenarios so that we can easily transfer without necessarily having to have tons and tons of labeled data, maybe just a few samples that we can easily do information retrieval or IR with. Um, and uh, for that, it would be wonderful as well to have a lot of additional representation so that we have portability and index efficiently and uh, frankly, so that our storage costs aren't astounding. So the way that we tackle this is via metric learning. We use metric learning to arrive at a generic representation where neighboring samples are contextually and semantically similar. Um, and we incorporate enrichment into our metric learning um, approach from multiple sources. We do not want to make any assumptions about the downstream task labels a priori, and yet we want to be able to use the learning embedding for multiple downstream tasks, um, including retrieval via some distance measure or fine tuning novel classifiers. Now, I do make a, a slight disclaimer, right? So, um, some people, when they hear metric learning, will think we are talking strictly about strict metrics and metric spaces. Uh, we are not making any such a sense here. So, at the high level, here is our system design in schematic form. Um, binaries are featureized, and data is extracted to support pairwise uh, comparisons. Uh, this data is used in conjunction with the featureized data then to train an embedding model. And the generated embedding model can be applied to multiple downstream tasks. Now, when we talk metric embeddings, um, we need some measure of similarity. Uh, how do we measure the similarity between two binaries and what, what sort of auxiliary enrichment data can we use? Well, in this case, we chose to use Mandiant's CAPA tool. Uh, CAPA is a capabilities analysis tool released by Mandiant's Flare team. It is open source and it utilizes a variety of 
rules and heuristics to output both capabilities as well as TTPs used by different executable um, types. So currently there's both the P, ELF, .NET, and shellcode files. Um, I have a link to the repository and uh, I encourage you to read the series of blog posts as well and frankly to use the CAPA tool in your own projects if you're interested as it is open source. So here's an example of what the output from CAPA looks like. Uh, capabilities here are shown in orange. Um, and uh, as you can see, we have uh, sort of a high level um, description of various capabilities, including sending data, receiving data, uh, various socket connections, um, Mantex creation, checking possession, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, I would mention again that these are retrieved uh, for each file through a cumbersome disassembly process. And so, um, in order to do this on the fly, it would take a little bit of time. One of the uh, ideal aspects of our approach is that we can actually get a lot of this embedding uh, or a lot of this information into our embeddings um, and really do static ML in a way that's actually quite rapid. So we don't have to disassemble um, all the time necessarily. So how do we incorporate this into a metric learning regime? Well, first let's review a little bit how metric learning works. Um, the idea is that we have input samples that are similar and dissimilar. We have some notion of measuring similarity and we would like to learn some sort of a transformation, in this case, some sort of a neural network that within an embedding space will make similar samples cluster together and to similar samples uh, move farther apart. So how do we do this? Well, a common approach to metric learning, one of the more common, is this notion of contrasting loss, where we have actually a really simple loss function and our aim precisely to do just that. We we push together pull apart pairs of positively or negatively associated samples, and then we have positive and negative margins as well, which are you, you can sort of think of um, as optimization bounds, if, if you will. I mean, beyond a certain point of closeness together or farthest uh, or, or, or distance apart, we don't necessarily want to penalize. So. If we want to use this approach to enrich the capital, uh, one of the ways that we can do this is by forming distinct capital clusters, applying clustering, and then applying contrast loss on an in cluster versus out of cluster basis. Um, there is a little bit of an issue with this approach alone, or a shortcoming, I should say. And the shortcoming is that um, if we do a purely contrasted regime, there's no notion of Intercluster or intersample similarity. Um, so uh, this is illustrated on the on the left hand schematic or cartoon, if you will. Um, we see that there are a few distinct clusters uh, where the similar are shown in uh, the similar samples in the same cluster are shown in blue, and then dissimilar samples are shown in orange. However, what you see is that regardless of how far apart the orange samples are. Um, they're penalized the same. So is there maybe a more fine-grained approach that we can provide to you that will uh, incorporate this, this notion of intersample or, or, or intercluster similarity without, w w without necessarily uh, penalizing everything the same and, and taking some form of distance into account? Well, this is actually uh, one of the major contributions of this work. Um, so we do this with a Spearman rank class. And for this, we utilize research um, on teaching neural networks, sorting and ranking. Um, specifically, our loss uses the Spearman rank correlation coefficient. Um, and the idea here is that with respect to ground truth ranks on similarities, we want our neural network to as closely match that as possible. Um, now, 
again, this notion of similarity. Well, I mentioned that we use cap to establish similarity. Oh, sorry. Uh, good. Uh, yeah, so um, for, for the similarity, um, the way that we do this is we can use uh, some sort of set wise similarity between sets of um, cap attributes. And in our case, we use the card similarity towards this end. As a base uh, network representation, um, this is shown in the schematic. We have four dense blocks, and we use uh, Ember features as input. So our input starts from 2381 dimensions. Uh, Although the featureization could be whatever, I mentioned this approach is, is rather generic, um, but we ultimately map to a lower dimensional embedding space. In this case, we utilized 32 dimensional embedding, although this again is a hyperparameter that could be um, played around with a little bit. For an evaluation protocol, we um, derived an embedding representation from the Ember training partition along with Kappa V1 telemetry. We then performed fine tuning under five different experimental regimes. The first of our three fine tuning experiments are on the Ember 2018 dataset. And then the uh, final two are on the SORL 20 million dataset. For the first experiment, we fine tune on Ember. Um, and then we, uh, on the Ember trading partition, and then we evaluate on the Ember test partition under a malware detection regime. So malicious benign labels. For this, we see several combinations of um, metric learning losses and their, and their performance. We see that while contrastive performs the best, um, a combination of contrastive and Spearman uh, eats out a substantial amount better performance. Unfortunately, we still underperform a baseline uh, raw neural network fit on um, the Ember features directly. In our second experiment, we look at the family classification task using family labels on Ember. Um, what we find here is that we see a consistent ordering in terms of what embedding type we use. But in this case, we're actually within really, really close striking distance of, uh, of the baseline of a rock classifier that is fit um, directly on the, uh, on the features. In our third experiment, we took the detector that we had fine-tuned on Ember and then decided to evaluate on the uh, Sorel test partition, we see a performance decay. Uh, the performance here is not terribly impressive, um, but we still see a similar ordering. And this isn't surprising, right? I mean, we're, we're talking about fine tuning on um, one data set and then evaluating on another data set with a classifier that wasn't amazing in the first place. However, when we go to fine tune directly on Sorel, and I stress that we are using an embedding representation that was trained on Ember, we come within very close striking distance of the Sorel 20 million light GBM benchmark. We see again consistent performance orderings with respect to the loss type. And I would mention that this, this is kind of an impressive result. We're able to achieve roughly the same performance with a 32 dimensional embedding, uh, again, throughout a different data set. We then looked at the uh, SORL attribute classification task. So uh, we're, we're looking here at not, not attributes, but high level, um, very high level attributes for, for, each, um, for, for each binary. Um, for example, adware, crypto miner, download with dropper, et cetera. And uh, again, for this task, we see that the weighted combination of 
um, multiple losses, the embedding drive for that, uh, on average, being the highest AUIC. So we're seeing sort of consistency across the board in terms of our uh, in terms of our representations and the the respective performances. Um, and uh, I would also mention, I mean, we're performing way better than certainly random here, right? So we're uh, we're clearly also getting something out of our embeddings. However, we're not performing quite as well as the uh, attribute benchmarks um, that, that come with the SORL data set. I would mention that our uh, experiments in, in our comparison here are, are also kind of, um, well, we're not using as powerful as the representation, you might say, um, just by virtue of how we did this. But um, it, it's not it's not surprising that the SORL multi-objective network performed better than we did. Um, so, what can we glean from this work and what can we glean from our experiments here? Well, we've introduced a fine-grained approach um, to metric embedding, as well as uh, utilized a coarse-grained approach, which is uh, novel only in so far as the cloaking goes and, and the use of copy tags. Um, but we find that consistent with a lot of the other literature on multi-objective optimization, particularly for malware. Um, combining approaches and balancing loss magnitudes does improve performance. Um, this is always good to see consistency with prior work, right? Um, when it comes to storage complexity and, uh, and, and, and just the amount of space required, uh, keep in mind that SORL is actually, uh, well, a, a pretty sizable data set, right? As far as open source data sets, it's the largest uh, there is and by, by a wide margin too. The features alone take 172 gigabytes. And this is really cumbersome for running experiments on. I mean, unless you have some clever batching strategy, which isn't excruciatingly hard to implement, but it's still a little bit of engineering. Um, you need at least a terabyte of RAM for this. Um, using our embeddings, well, we can run comparable experiments just on your stock 16 gigabyte laptop. Um, the net size is just 2.1 gigabytes for representing the entire data set. We could also likely improve our performance a lot um, by incorporating other labeling information. So we went kind of out of our way to say, Let's not incorporate any labels of the type that we do downstream experiments on. Um, we don't want to make any a priori assumptions, but we could very easily um, incorporate malicious design losses, attribute tagging losses, uh, attack tactics, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that a really, really big win here um, by doing that would be if we were actually able to get in our low dimensional embedding space, better performance than a classifier that's just trained on raw feature space, or at least comparable for a lot of tasks. Uh, I, I would also mention that while we haven't talked a lot about retrieval in this talk, uh, one mention is important. Um, you know, even if you have KD trees or ball trees or VP trees, et cetera, uh, things still break down on doing distance comparisons in high dimensional spaces. So. In the future, it would be interesting to look into a resiliency of metric embedding approaches to concept drift, um, look across data sets across time, et cetera, to see how applicable they are in that sort of a regime. Um, it would also be really interesting to look at metric embeddings on other data, um, you know, similar approaches. Our, our approach is not super tight to malware. We've done experiments with malware here, but there, there are a lot of other ML for InfoSec use cases beyond. So, um, yeah, we're at 20 now. And so, with that, I'll, uh, I'll take some questions. <laughs>